in New York. Um, welcome. Um, I, I can't tell you how thrilled I am that we are kicking this off. This is a key program of List New York City and just, you know, incredibly important to the uh, economic development ecosystem uh, in the city and at this time. So I'll tell you a little bit about that momentarily, but I'm gonna ask Ibrahim, I guess, if that's you, <laughs> to move to the next slide, give you a little background about LISC and uh, LISC New York City. We are an intermediary. And basically we raise capital um, and that capital is, is in reinvested in disinvested communities, marginalized communities, um, used to uh, support um, the, the um, you know, populations that have been um, addressing or operating within a systemic inequity, right? And that's very important to us. And we, everything we do is very deliberate and very strategic to address those uh, issues. So uh, slide three um, basically um, talks about our platform. Of course, we've been around for 40 years. We're the New York City franchise. Um, and we have been um, doing this for 40 years. We are the flagship in New York City. Um, we were the first, but um, we are also like to consider ourselves innovative and groundbreaking and cutting edge. And um, as we did the, the work, um, particularly during the pandemic, we wanted to sit back and ensure that as we continue to move forward to meet the needs of the communities that depend upon us and our community partners, that we were framing it on a platform. And our platform really resonates with everything that we do. Everything that we do stands on a platform of racial and economic equity, looking to move uh, those systemic barriers to a place of equity for the folks in our community. And we do that through three uh, pillars, and these three pillars hold up our platform. The first is a uh, radical uh, healing. And basically uh, with radical healing, we're looking to ensure that we are speaking very unapologetically, very directly, that we live in a society of systemic inequities. And in order for that inequities to be eradicated, we have to heal, we have to talk about it, um, you know, directly, and then, um, you know, be active in leg legislative and policy advocacy to address those and, um, inequities and how do we make them move forward as we develop programming. The second um, pillar is inclusive economic transformation, and that's our investment. How do we look and prioritize our investment? How do we target them to look at public infrastructure, whether that's affordable housing, community um, infrastructure, commercial real estate in the community uh, quarters that we work. We um, uh, invest not only financial capital, but we best invest in human capital, providing capacity building, looking at human talent, innovation, working with small businesses to build up you know, their uh, sustainability in the long term, and we do that through, um, you know, working with community-based organizations, nonprofits, CDCs that are on the ground in the neighborhoods, working to ensure that they are being impactful as community organization. And then the third pillar is sustainable wealth generation. What are the uh, elements that are necessary? What have been the barriers for those um, groups, minority, black, brown, immigrant, other BIPOC populations? that have kept them from uh, generating wealth, sustainability, and through generations. And how can we look to support that? That's entrepreneurship uh, growth, ownership, whether it's business ownership or home ownership, looking at uh, careers and opportunities and industries where we can build career ladders uh, through financial mobility and workforce development with our many partners. So all of this is very important to the work that we do. Now, how does the developers of color fit within this? And we can advance to the next slide um, and talk a little bit about why we think it's important and those structural barriers, as I mentioned. So what we are doing at List New York City is that we're looking at this issue of um, systemic inequities in the ecosystem that builds out um, economic development community development and addressing them in all of those uh, three pillars that I meant, uh, mentioned earlier in all of our programming so that we have a holistic uh, service of delivery. 
that the each of the programs are feeding off one another, that we provide a continual of capital, patient capital, liquidity, equity. How are these things moving forward, uh, the growth of businesses, whether it's the actual physical, um, you know, uh, uh, production and development of infrastructure uh, or small businesses. Though all those things are tied together. And we think that the real estate sector is really the basis of that. And it covers many of those areas, but then also um, supports uh, economic and de community development growth. So we'll be doing that through there. And then, uh, you know, we want to have an infrastructure that's enabling, enabling community and economic development. And we've done that by looking citywide through public-private partnerships. Um, some of our partners on the phone, um, our Wilkins here as well, and other, you know, partners in, in other disciplines that all have the same mission, all have the same goal, so that we as a collaborative collectively can put forth uh, programs, um, invest capital, um, put forth uh, organizations that build within that a collaborative ideal. So uh, the next slide just briefly talks about a couple of the programs that we're working on. One was the uh, marketed agent training that we did in partnership with New York City's Housing Preservation and Development, the uh, enterprise um, organization, which was funded by Goldman Sachs. Uh, the Developers of Color Training Program is another, but we're looking to expand this to look at um, uh, real estate lawyers and appraisers and contractors and all of the elements that make up a real estate industry so that when we are looking at development in communities uh, of color, that the people who are developing uh, housing, healthcare facilities, community facilities, commercial infrastructure, bring that uh, cultural integrity to the building out of that community. So we are very excited to start this phase of the program. We are so glad that you were here to join us. We look forward to telling you about this particular program, as well as the other work that we'll be doing uh, in, within this holistic service delivery. Uh, we welcome you, ask questions, uh, and we look forward to um, working with uh, within the industry to um, move forward our holistic service delivery. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Eva Allegood, Deputy Director of Listen NYC, to talk a little bit specifically about the Developers of Color Training Program. Thank you, Valerie. Um, as, as everyone can see, this is part of a broad vision, and we're so excited to tell you more about, I'm sure you're, you've all signed on because you're interested in particular in the Developers of Color Training Program. And what I want to do is just um, provide a little background for how we developed the program, because it's really integral to how it's designed. Uh, we, we felt it was really important that we do something different, that we make sure that we're not just creating another program for the market, but that we hear from those who um, would benefit from it, what they see their needs are, what are the struggles, what are the things they're trying to address. And we use that data from the market uh, to inform the design of the program. So what we did at the beginning, um, feels like a long time ago, it wasn't that long ago, earlier this year, we put out a call for qualified consultants to help us with this discovery phase where we wanted to know from interviews with stakeholders, developers of color, um, as I said, gather data about their experiences, their needs, what is it um, that has been addressed to date and what's still missing in terms of helping them to grow their firms and get more business. And uh, we also wanted to hear from our government partners as Valerie laid out, we really feel that it's very important that everything we do is through partnerships with nonprofits, for-profits, um, philanthropy, and government. And in this case, of course, our government partners are key. Um, our government partners put out RFPs. They um, control land that uh, we want our developers of color to have access to, to develop. And um, we wanted to gather their insights about what they've done so far and how can we partner to make this really um, impactful program. Um, so we also wanted a consult to help us come up with performance metrics and um, to come up with a way to tie everything together where what's learned in the, in the actual program is then connected to opportunities to get deals and also access capital. 
So um, with that, if you could, uh, Ibrahim, if you could get us to the next slide, I'm really thrilled to introduce our partner, um, the, as I said, uh, MBE firm that we were looking for to help us with this really critical phase, um, RF Wilkins Consultants. We have our, the um, Chief Executive Officer, Francilia Wilkins Rahim here to tell us about that market study and really lay out how the findings from her research led to the critical components of this program. So um, all of her qualifications are up here. She's amazing. She has a long track record of doing this work of identifying needs and partnering with different agencies to increase opportunity for MWBE firms. You can see the list of very remarkable projects that she's worked on, and we're just thrilled to have her here today. And with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Francilia to tell us all about what she found. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. First of all, I want to thank Eva. I want to thank Ibrahima. I want to thank Valerie just for the dynamic work that LISC has been putting forward, um, kind of stepping forward as a leader in this conversation, um, a change maker doing dynamic work that some people have been fearful to do. But I am so impressed and so excited at how LISC is tackling all this head on um, in a dynamic and forthright way. I think that for a long time, um, we have known about the various inequities as Valerie has mentioned, as it pertains to African-Americans across all um, spheres of business um, in the United States, in this nation that we live in. Um, and there's been a number of different ways to kind of try to tackle and address these issues. But I think that we've reached a point in our kind of the, the in our history. Um, and I think this period is going to be written down in the textbooks as a time of real dynamic change. And I think this program, um, this developers of color program, is going to really change how minority real estate developers with that targeted focus on African-American real estate developers are engaged in the market. I think it's so important to know that development usually falls at the top as it pertains to the economic system. And so if we're looking at an ecosystem of African-American businesses, whether they're subcontractors, whether they're, you know, um, all different areas of you know, professional service organizations, we all kind of fall under the top of the, the market, which is development. That's where a whole lot of money is going. So this program, this initiative um, is really here to support that. And I'm excited to share this information with you today. So as Valerie mentioned, as Eva mentioned, a few months ago, we all came together and began to really figure out what is it that the market needs? And as we surveyed and we spoke to individuals, we spoke to the African-American developers, we spoke to various developers of different sizes um, in the market, we spoke to government officials, we spoke to financiers and banks and different entities to get everyone's you know, well-rounded perspective on what are the needs and what are the things that are impacting participation. Um, and what we got from that was varied. So in the market, we kind of understood that one, developers of color are not monolithic. I think we think about black firms or we think about minority firms, MWBEs, and there's always this like very wide umbrella approach um, put above all of them. And I think that one of our biggest market findings was like, just like any other group, these folk are diverse, their needs are diverse. Capital, I always say is the start for most folk, um, but their needs overall are diverse. So if we're developing a program that will be a leading initiative in the market, we want to ensure that we're addressing these diverse needs um, in a way that's very kind of custom. Um, we also realize that beyond this conversation of capacity, which we find to frequently come up as it pertains to minority firms, we, we saw the real um, examples of how biases were perpetuated in the market and how these assumptions not only led to a um, more difficult ability to access capital and financing, but they also led to more difficulty for minority developers to participate in the market. 
Um, and so from there, we said, okay, well, what's available as it pertains to financing? We saw that not only, you know, I always like to say back in the day, and that's really like five years ago. Uh, five years ago, the capital conversation was the thing, right? Um, it's still the thing, but now we're looking at it a little differently. So before, it was difficult for a minority developer to even get access to financing of any kind. You would get into a bank and we've all heard the stories, whether you're a developer or other type of business, trying to tap into capital for your business and being a person of color, being a black person, you know, it, th there were so many hurdles before even getting to the door, right? But now, and I think, you know, everything that has happened in, in the nation has really helped to drive this forward. We're seeing a little more access as it pertains to loans. But I think the conversation um, and where we're driving it towards now is equity capital. When we look at the majority of developers in the market and how successful they've been, we see in many cases that they had, they've had varied um, types of access to equity capital. The capital that not only supports the project, but supports the, the business and the back office and all of the other things that are needed to be successful in the market. Um, and so we found all of the different systemic structures that are limited, limiting access to this equity or mezzanine capital, as we would call it in the market, um, the private relationships that are needed um, to be successful as a developer, and so on and so forth. So from there, we kind of gauge that there's not only a need for technical assistance, and I think sometimes market programs, we jump right into let's provide technical assistance. Yes, that is a need, but we said, how can we marry this provision of technical assistance and additional capacity and knowledge and know-how with relationships which are so much needed and with an access to capital to create a outstanding and dynamic leading program where developers will have a true opportunity to succeed. Ibrahima, if you can turn to the next slide, please. So from there, after kind of putting all of these things together, LISC has now developed and we're excited to launch New York City's Developer of Color Training Program. Our focus is to look at M MBE developers. We wanna see folk expand their capacity. We wanna see folk have real access to projects. Our goal is to even help developers while you are doing a deal to provide the technical support to help you move your deal forward while you are in the midst of doing a deal. We want to see this market become more competitive. And we know what's happening. We know that the market right now is shifting. Opportunities are opening up. The government is having more pipeline. Um, private entities are having more pipeline. And at this time, we have said, LISC has said, we will not miss out on this opportunity and we will not allow another year to go by and we will not look back and say, you know, what happened? Where, where did we miss it? We're gonna tackle this head on. So through this program, developers will not only have the opportunity to achieve and access technical assistance, but also to leverage this support and back office support and capital access to build their portfolio and build a market. We all know at this point, we wanna do business. And we do business by getting access to capital and the resources and the professionals and the support that we need. Um, and so it's so exciting to see that this is the direction we're moving in. Can I get the next slide, please? So I'll quickly give you an overview of the program elements. And the last I'll tell you is the most exciting. So I want to speak really fast so I can get to it. Um, the program is going to be developed support leveraging both technical assistance and support capa capital support and capacity support that's how we're looking at this in a comprehensive manner we will not only participants will have the ability to receive instruction through modules um, through workshops through in-person engagement to meet people in the market and build relationships in the market we are having experienced professionals from all different walks both on the private and and government side who will be engaging this process and supporting participants. Um, participants will have coaching by experienced real estate developers and like I mentioned before, support and real-time assistance with the deals that they have in their pro project pipeline. Um, also, you know, we saw in many cases sometimes how in the industry real time, because of the lack of relationships with industry professionals or government agencies, um, wasn't necessarily readily available, 
our developers, um, the individuals that we're targeting for this program would sometimes just be stuck for a year or two years or even more, or not even be able to get through the front door. So through LISP Developer of Color program, we will be driving those opportunities forward. We will be supporting their growth. Um, and we will be ensuring that all of our participants in this first cohort and all following cohorts can really be successful um, in engaging uh, real-time relationships. And then finally, my favorite thing and the last thing that I'm sharing with you all today is this Shark Tank-like investor pitch program. So equity, 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 equity capital has been the conversation that every single developer, I don't care if you're big or small, that you have. And so what LISC has committed to is designing at the end of the year, at the end of each program, a yearly conference where we won't only support um, all of the um, participation, market participation, and try to inform the industry about how important it is to be diverse and inclusive in their work. But we will let participants who have gone through our program participate in a Shark Tank-like investor pitch conference, con, um, conference where they will be able to get capital resources, equity-based resources for their deals. Um, so this program, again, is dynamic. It is groundbreaking. It is something that has not yet been seen in the market. And we are so excited to partner with the community to make this a success. Thank you, Ibrahima. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Francilia, for painting that picture of what you found in a marketplace, uh, validating what our initial assumptions and hypothesis was. Um, and with that being said, us really being positioned now to launch this program. So the next few things that, I'm, that we're going to cover um, on my end uh, is essentially on eligibility. Um, we're being very intentional in terms of the type of businesses that we want to focus on. Um, of course, uh, we're looking for businesses that are located uh, in New York City or at least the metropolitan New York City area. Um, extended into Long Island region, uh, and of course, into parts of Westchester County, and then into northern New Jersey. Now, what's most important, um, as you can see, is that we do want uh, any interested firms to uh, essentially have uh, a good portion of their business, a signif significant portion of their business being conducted in or invested in New York City, uh, because we do believe that uh, when we're doing all of this economic development work, uh, it's important that jobs are being created. Um, and uh, so that's one important thing. In addition to that, uh, in terms of the type of business, of course, minority owned, we understand that uh, depending on the structure and, and the deals that you may, uh, the business sort of structures that you may uh, um, set up, uh, that sometimes you may have other uh, equity partners, uh, but we do want the entities to be at least 51% uh, owned, operated and managed by uh, individual that is of color, uh, specifically ethnic, ethnically owned. So we have it listed here of who those, uh, who we identify those as being. Um, we are encouraging that the type of MBE firms that we'd like to select and work with be certified uh, with the city and state. Um, now, this is a preference, it's not a requirement, uh, but that is something that we will be looking, looking at when we're reviewing applications that are submitted. And as been, has been shared as well by both Francilia and early on um, by uh, Valerie in terms of our vision and, and, uh, and what uh, type of uh, entities that we're looking to support through this program, it's important for us um, to be able to identify those uh, MBE developers that are new to, the, to this field or new to the market. Um, we're really looking for folks that have the experience, um, have engaged in some successful um, projects uh, and deals um, be it on the private or, uh, or public sector side. Um, so that is another requirement that at least having five years of experience um, in this real estate development um, uh, space. In addition to that, um, we are looking, when we're talking about you know, experience and whatnot um, in this space that you have tangible um, and you know, sort of track record of real estate development projects, be it on the affordable housing side, uh, be it on commercial spaces, um, again, we, we're, we're here, we're saying if, if it's up to 50 units that you've done or up to 15,000 square foot, um, that would be preferable, but it is not mandatory. Uh, but again, we want businesses that are, uh, have that experience and can be able to, you know, 
um, add on and take, take the next steps um, with this value-added program that we're doing. Okay, of course, again, we're still looking at businesses that are relatively uh, small or, or in a way micro uh, enterprise level. Um, so we've deemed that to be firms that have uh, less than 50 employees of both full-time and part-time. And I know there may be uh, combinations of those that may be um, um, onboarded for certain contractual based um, work. But of course, again, our goal is that uh, we want to you know, identify that niche of, uh, of, of, of MBEs, that MBE developers that are in this space. Um, and lastly, one of the key pillars of, as well is really uh, MBE applicants or MBE developer applicants that have uh, a pending or an existing um, or brewing deal that they have in the pipeline. Um, as part of what this curriculum and program entails is not only is it on the um, a bit of the uh, skills building knowledge expansion, but we do want you all to be able to approach us, um, at least the program with some sort of deal in the pipeline that you are looking um, to receive additional support. And, and again, leveraging the, uh, uh, the resources that we have available through the coaches and the uh, instructors that have years of experience um, in this space and have, again, a track record of uh, uh, successfully um, delivering on development work, uh, again, both on the private and, and public sector side. Next thing here is just giving you all sort of a, a high level overview of the curriculum uh, that, we're, that will be delivered. Um, of course, the sort of two prong, one is really uh, on the real estate process and team building, um, as you all probably well aware. Uh, the importance of having a team that is uh, established. Um, so, you know, there are going to be some, some uh, topics that will be covered on a more uh, granular basis on, you know, what, what, are the, what are some of the key team members that you need to have on your, on your, uh, uh, on your team, right? Um, how do you actually develop those individuals? What are the key skill sets that's needed? Uh, for the head of the, of, of the firm, I'm sure there are certain expertise that you all may have, but there are uh, certainly gaps there as well, right? How do you identify those individuals that can be able to fill in uh, and again, be of a value add uh, in this space of, um, uh, in this endeavor? And of course, as well, there are multiple different avenues uh, and, and uh, ways of approaching this uh, development space. So we're, we're, there will be courses or rather topics that'll cover, you know, understanding what are the phases of multifamily uh, development projects. Uh, what's involved in terms of, you know, asset management and uh, building out a, a timeline and uh, the pre-development work. Uh, and of course, as well, there are mixed use uh, development projects as well that can be considered. Certainly, when you're looking at affordable housing um, projects now that, are, that have been supported by the city, which there are portions of it being uh, allocated for residential and a portion of it being for commercial and understanding what those processes is um, and also giving that refreshing also giving the uh, opportunity to see what are what are the avenues you can all be able to um, pursue and of course when it comes to the deal uh, making and the deals being in the pipeline um, as we all know there's there is a process a formal process of our rfp which can be tedious which can be cumbersome um, so we do intend to have a portion of the of the curriculum focused on um, how do you actually put together uh, a proposal response but not one that's just a simple response, but one that'll be a, uh, a winning response, right? So there will be more information about you know, how do you go through selecting and evaluating the sites that are of interest, uh, being able to understand, um, you know, how do you uh, uh, identify the appropriate uh, agencies such as the um, HPD uh, or, or the uh, EDC and other economic development agencies that are uh, looking for developers to turn and flip certain certain areas across the city to be uh, affordable housing projects or development work that will be beneficial um, for the city. And lastly, just wanted to go over sort of the timeline. Um, the applications did open yesterday um, and we're thrilled to see again that uh, we received a handful of applications already. Um, uh, it'll be open for the next two weeks until the 21st of October. Um, and about a week after that, we will have made our decisions on the selected uh, cohort or roster of, of MBEs uh, and then provide them with the uh, appropriate information as it relates to the curriculum, uh, when it will start, the 
Uh, all of the details will then be provided by, uh, uh, by the end of this month. Um, and essentially the first cycle will begin um, uh, from October until January of next year. And then lastly, concluding with what Francilia had described about this Shark Tank Investor Pitch Conference that we're very excited to, uh, to host. And we know that you all are uh, probably excited about that as well, um, because at the end of it, um, being developers, as we know, it's about the financing, it's about having the investment um, and the capital in order to engage in the, the vision and the endeavors that you all uh, are pursuing. Um, if there isn't any financing at the end of it or investment um, in this space, as you all are aware, you're pretty much at a, uh, at a, at a standstill. Um, so we're doing our part to be able to position our MBE developers in New York City, in the metropolitan area, to really be able to leverage it. Um, and in addition to that, creating a, uh, uh, in a way, a different program, slightly different, which again, we're very focused on the area there. So with that being said, we're going to move into the Q&A. So again, in the uh, Zoom Q&A button, um, just submit your questions. We will begin filtering through and uh, doing our best to give you the appropriate responses uh, or clarification that you may have. All right, so we'll, so we have one question here already. So uh, can real estate projects be located in Newark, New Jersey or are projects only supposed to be in the state of New York? Eva, uh, I'll give you the floor for that. Um, sorry, sorry. About that. there seems to be an echo. Maybe you need to mute uh, Ibrahima while I'm talking. Uh, okay, it, the, the echo went away, thank you. Uh, so I think um, we're, we are going to take a broad look at what comes in in terms of um, people's interest and background. In terms of the, the where the project is, as uh, Ibrahima said, we are looking to focus on New York City. But if you are a developer that um, has done the majority of your business in New York City and the deal that you want assistance with doesn't neatly fit that, I would say I encourage you to apply and we'll see how your application compares to others that we get. Uh, but we have laid out very clearly what our priorities are. So I think with that, you can, um, you know, see that, that we'll have a, an emphasis on projects in New York City. Again, I don't want to discourage people who may, you know, have always done the majority of their business in New York City and have one particular project that they're doing outside um, that's in the pipeline. I won't say that's a no. Do we have another question? Yes, another question here is what if the firm's experience level is slightly less than five years? Will they still be eligible to, to apply? Should I tackle that one, Eva? All right. So I think that um, one, we're, we're encouraging five years. Um, and we, but we, we have a little bit of flexibility as we're looking at this. So this is a first cohort. We really want to see what applications are coming in. Um, we want to ensure that the first cohort of, of folk have our kind of similar level as it pertains to experience. Um, so we're not looking for firms who are very, very, very super brand new and this is their first kind of caveat into the industry. But we are looking for, firm, but if you don't hit the exact five years and you're at four or, or something like that, or, or maybe you have worked for another underneath a developer for some time, you know, you can apply that in. So I think that we're flexible as it pertains to some of these um, structures, but we want to ensure at the end of the day, when we pick this first cohort, we want to ensure that, um, you know, folk are coming in at a similar level um, and we can use this program as a platform to elevate and escalate and bring them into that next level. Um, so again, we encourage you to apply, um, even if you don't match up exactly to every single one of these um, expectations. We're going to do a very detailed review of all applications that come in. And even, you know, in some cases, maybe even have a conversation if we have questions um, on some of the experience. Um, and so don't be afraid of applying. And, you know, hopefully, and I, I'm pretty sure this will be an uh, amazing first launch, we will be having another cohort 
right following after. So please apply um, and don't let that be the thing to hold you back. Thanks, Francilia. And I, I think we have a related question that I see in the chat box here um, that I thought I'd uh, you know, provide some uh, an answer to, and you can jump back in as well, Francilia. But I, I know somebody was asking, what are, was our reasoning for the five-year lead time on MWBE developers applying to the program? And really, it has to do with what Francilia, Francilia said. In her market research, she saw that there were developers at all different stages, and we didn't want a program that's trying to be everything to everybody. We know there are some existing programs for more entry level um, firms that have been in adjacent industries and are now trying to make the transition, um, want to get sort of the A to Z, you know, um, kind of overview of what um, real estate development looks like. We, we, we didn't want to mix in a small cohort, mix together people who are at that stage with the more um, emerging developers who have about that five year experience that really could benefit from this, the particular components of this program. So again, it's not a hard and fast rule exactly. If you, if you cut off just, just under five years, we're not gonna consider you, but we did wanna share that rationale for why we wanted to create a cohort of firms that are more or less in the same place. And Francisca, feel free to add to anything. No, yeah, definitely agree, Eva. And I think it's so important, especially as we're having that conversation around access and capital and those next step things. It's good to have a little bit portfolio and experience um, and knowledge um, to just be able to be ready. We want to end this first cohort um, being able to say, like, we really were able to see real time impacts on the bottom line of these businesses. Um, and so to do that effectively, we're saying one, you know, apply. Two, we're saying there are qualifications. However, we're looking at each one of the applications independently. And three, we're saying we're here to be your support in the application process, as well as moving forward as we move this project forward. Um, so we're here to, um, you know, really make sure that folk who are participating have that experience and are ready to go. Thank you, Eva and Francilia. Another question we have here a difficulty often occurs when dealing with those city and state agencies to provide access at the table for minority developers with the equity required to be qualified for a deal. Question is, what have these agencies pledged to do to move this in a different direction? So that, can I tackle this one? So that's actually a really good question. Um, one of the key things we did in the research process were we spoke to these agencies, um, especially the major housing agencies on the city side and some on the state side that we know you experience difficulties with. Um, I've been there with you. Um, and every single one of the agents, and not only the agencies, but the market entities that we spoke to, the market organizations, some of which you, you know the names of, um, they all said one, they have been shifting their model internally. So if you look at the market, you'll see HPD just made a commitment, 25% equity participation for minority developers. NYCHA just made a commitment. They're looking at um, shifting um, and leveraging the city-based uh, uh, MWBE program to inform participation for minorities um, in, 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 in NYCHA programs moving forward. Um, EDC, everyone is looking and saying, we've been doing something that doesn't work here. Um, we know it's time to shift and we're ready. So most agencies have already committed to participating as whether it's in the curriculum or, you know, participating as, you know, a meet and greet or whatever. So you can get the opportunity to meet the program and project managers that they have on the ground um, and others. And we will continue to speak with everybody and figure out how they want to commit. So I will tell you this, that Agencies right now are, are shifting. They are opening up access. They are creating programs just internally agency-wide that are opening up access. And they're saying, give us a pipeline of people who can tap into this stuff, right? And our goal is to create that pipeline and the participants in this initiative will be directly linked as a pipeline into these programs and initiatives that are existing um, in, the, um, in the city. So hopefully that answers your question, but there has been commitment um, and there has been participation. And we have literally 
um, been able to, prior to this, um, define the exact areas of pain points uh, for developers trying to tackle these agencies. So we have a clear outline on what that looks like. Another question here is in regards to HPD's uh, similar program. They're having a HPD uh, building capacity training program, which will start on the 25th of October, running until May of next year. Uh, their question is, what do we know what days this our developers of color program will be taking place, the times? Eva, I don't know if you want to. We, we don't, we're not ready to release the dates yet. We certainly will tell the accepted um, participants. I would say if you're already in HPD's program, I would not advise that you try to do two programs at once. So <laughs> I don't, I think um, choosing one or the other is the better route to go. Um, and Francilia, feel free to add anything to that as well. No, I agree. I think both programs are going to be kind of comprehensive and aggressive. And I, as a business owner, understand you as a fellow business owner that you have but so much time. Um, and I think that it makes sense to, if you're doing the HPD program in this round, maybe wait for the second round for this program. Um, this is just the start. Um, and so I would say, pick one, choose the one that you think best fits your needs at this time. And that would be the program that I, I think you should commit to. So agreed, Eva. Another question here is the number of team members from each firm that can attend. So is the cohort only open to one team member of an organization or can multiple members of the team participate? I can take you, I can take that one on. Um, yeah, we, we, it, we are targeting this program to the owner of the firm. And sometimes they're co-owners, but it needs to be at least one owner of the firm. So that's a given, but we are opening it up to an additional person. We know often there's a right-hand person or somebody on the team that um, could be very helpful in also gaining from the material and being able to follow up on um, the learning. So that we are making the, it optional for a firm to um, ask to bring a second person. But like I said, it's, it's not optional um, to have the owner be the, the primary participant in the program. And, in, and you'll see when you fill out the application, um, you fill it out as the firm and then the owner of the firm and then there's a section where you can list an additional person that you would like to attend. And the coaching would be with the two people at the same time. So you'd have one coach for the, the two different staff members. Another question here is in regards to course requirements and employees. So the question is, can you elaborate on the reasoning behind the courses and requirements? In particular, if a developer has 49 employees or less, they probably would not need this course on multi-family development. So I'll go ahead and take that. Um, so we, first of all, look at employees in various ways, right? If you're a developer and, you know, you're on a project, you may have an internal, your full-time actual staff of three, four people, five people, but you, you, you have a deal and you have a whole construction team of people that are under you that might be in the tens, fifteens, twenties. Um, and so the way how this program is structured, you may want to do this initiative. You may, and actually I know for sure many of them who do want to do this. Um, because they're still struggle with capacity or still struggle with, you know, accessing relationships with the agencies or, you know, accessing equity capital. I think that this initiative, again, is groundbreaking and that we are going beyond, we're providing technical assistance to show you how to do, this is not what this is. This is, you're getting that technical assistance and support, but you're also going to be able to work real time on a deal and troubleshoot on a deal. You also will get real time relationships. You also will be put in front of investors to invest capital into your project. So I think we're going a bit beyond the normal, you know, we're having a course and providing technical assistance. Um, I think that even when I look at HPD's program, a lot of the developers in their first cohort, if you 
they, their, you know, their staffing model was there were a lot of folk, you know, staff that they covered because they were doing work real time, but they still needed that additional support. So I think that's what the lens of the market looks like. And that's what we're looking to provide to you all. Another question here is in regards to joint ventures. Are joint ventures able to apply as one applicant? I, Eva, or did you want me to jump in there? We, we hadn't really considered that. Um, I think we want to, um, it's really designed to um, be targeted to a particular firm that's trying to grow their business. Um, so I think being in a joint venture can be helpful um, in terms of where you are in the development process. That's a good route to go for many, um, you know, for particular projects. Um, but we would be asking for a lead firm to be applying, not as a joint part, uh, venture, but as a, 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 an individual firm. All right, just want to make sure if, uh, Eva and Francilia, some folks are saying that my voice is a bit choppy. So in case you all are able to hear me, just repeat the questions. To everyone. Next question is, is there any fees to the organization for this program, is there any fees associated with this program? Easy answer, no, it's free. Don't we all love free things? I know I do. So no, no fees, it is free. And, and with that, I will just say to add to, um, yeah, Fr Francilia's note that it's free is that we will ask you to make a commitment to the program because as you can imagine, um, quite a few resources have gone into uh, putting this together. And we want to make sure it reaches those who are going to make the commitment of the time and not do just partial. So we will ask um, accepted uh, firms to sign on to a pledge that they will fully participate in the program. But other than that, no money will um, be changing hands um, from you to, to us. Next question here is, once the cohort has completed the program, how does LISC intend to keep in touch with the participants? to ensure opportunities and resources remain available. So the question was, how does LIS uh, plan in the future to stay in touch with participants to ensure resources are available? Um, that's important. I think I want to share that just from the just on a pure data perspective, um, the entities that are funding and supporting this want to see growth, right? And LISC wants to ensure that there's growth. And we all as business owners know that you're not, growth doesn't just happen in a few weeks. It is a conversation, it is a process, it is a up and down um, process. So leveraging surveying, leveraging constant contact, you will have access to the folk who are planning and implementing and you know moving your curriculum and classes forward. Um, you'll have access to the list team, you know, over time. We want we're, we I, and you know we're looking at other ways to just touch base with folk as we move forward. But the goal is not to just put you in the program and drop you. We want to see you win. Um, we are invested um, truly in seeing anyone participating in this win. So we wanna make sure that there's access at least for at minimum a year after the program to ensure that you're moving forward effectively. Okay, um, before we move to the next question, I wanna point out that we, um, first of all, that this program is um, generously supported through a number of different donors, um, corporate donors, um, philanthropic donors. I will give a shout out to our lead donor, uh, the first one, which is Capital One. And a good example of exactly what Francilia is talking about is a, is a company that wants to um, help grow these firms. And so we, we are going to be looking for opportunities for you to have, uh, develop those longer term relationships. We also are creating a credit enhancement fund here at List New York City that is going to help firms um, access uh, financing from LISC. And we don't see this as a one-off. We see this as a long-term relationship like everything else that we do at LISC New York City. Um, we stay, uh, we maintain relationships with our partners over decades and um, through thick and thin. And um, we try to bring a number of different resources necessary to advance your mission. So um, in this case, it's, it's, it's connections, it's financing, it's all those things. And so this is just the start and we are, and going back to Valerie's um, broader framework that she laid out at the very beginning of this session, 
Um, this is about building a, an ecosystem within the real estate industry that is um, driven by um, MBE firms and, and um, where there's wealth creation and um, really driving the market. And that's something that's going to take um, not just one program. So we're, we're gonna stick with you throughout the whole process. Excellent. And I wanna apologize to everyone. I do have a hard stop at three o'clock, but I can probably support in one additional question. Um, and you know, I know the team will continue to you know, move these questions forward and hopefully answer all of your needs. Um, we're, we're so excited to see all of this energy for this program. Thank you, Francilius. If you have to drop off, uh, that's okay. Uh, we are at the top of the hour, so we'll take one more question and the remainder will uh, allow for you all to submit it to us. The last question is, uh, a winning RFP can be quite costly for well-established developers in New York City. The question is, how will this program help in offsetting that cost for those MBE developers that do not have the resources to package a solid RFP application? I tell you, I think she just left. So I'll, I'll, no, you want to take that? Or? I'll say really quickly, I think that one, providing the technical support to just put everything together is so important when you're designing RFP. So that support will be there. Um, there and, you know, as we talk about equity capital at the end of the program, you know, if you're one of those winning teams, you have that capital to help support whatever it is you need to submit. So that'll be my last and final answer. And I appreciated the time with all of you. Thank you, Francilia and Eva and Valerie and you all that have joined us today. So it is now 3 p.m. We want to be respectful of all of your time. Um, so closing reminders again, if you are interested in applying, the application is now open. Uh, we just submitted in your chat the application link. Spread the word amongst your network. Uh, we're accepting applications until the 21st of October. Uh, and as, as, as you'll see as well, that uh, announcements will be made on the 28th of October. If there are any additional questions which we do see, please submit it to nycdevelopersofcolor at lisc.org. And a copy of this presentation will be shared afterwards. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone.